Rome spent the entire 2nd century BC in wars of conquest. The territory of the Republic doubled. Under Rome's rules there were vast lands in Spain, Gaul, the Balkans, Asia Minor and North Africa. An endless stream of captives poured into Italy. At the beginning of the 1st century BC, every third inhabitant of the Roman Republic was a slave. Such a massive concentration of enslaved people led to bloody revolts. The largest of these was the slave uprising led by Spartacus. Leading the army of fugitive slaves, the former gladiator Spartacus kept entire Italy in fear for three years. To cope with the uprising, Rome had to mobilize almost all forces. Despite the defeat, Spartacus remains a symbol of the struggle of the oppressed people for their freedom. We don't know much about Spartacus' personality. According to the most plausible version, he was one of the chieftains of the Thracian tribe of Medi. They lived in the Danube steppes and served in the auxiliary troops of Rome. When the Romans began to invade Thrace, Spartacus deserted. He was caught, enslaved and then sold to a gladiatorial school. Theodore Momsen believed that Spartacus came from the royal family of Spartakids, who ruled the Bosporan kingdom, but this is unlikely. The Romans as a rule did not enslave such noble captives. And the Thracians also used the name Sparadoc, which could easily have turned into Spartacus. It is only known for sure that before the uprising, Spartacus was a gladiator in the school of Lentulus Batiatus in Capua, and he had a special treatment, as he had a separate room and was allowed to live with his wife. The reason for the uprising was the use of the planned cleansing games. All participating gladiators were to die in the arena, becoming cleansing sacrifices for the people of Rome. Unwilling to be slaughtered, the gladiators drew up an escape plan, but the conspiracy was uncovered and they had to act swiftly. Rebels burst into the kitchen, grabbed knives, skewers and torches and fought their way to freedom. On the way out of the city, they captured a convoy carrying gladiatorial weapons and armed themselves properly. Mount Vesuvius became the first base of the fugitive gladiators. From there they raided Roman villas and villages located nearby. During skirmishes with Roman troops, they captured even more weapons and armor. Runaway slaves from the surrounding towns and villages began to join them. Very soon their number reached a couple of thousand. Three former gladiators led the rebels, the Thracian Spartacus and two Gauls, Crixus and Enomaus. At this time Rome was in the middle of two wars at once. In the west just at this time, News Pompey was gradually finishing off Quintus Sertorius, the last remaining supporter of Gaius Marius, and in the east Lucius Licinius Lucullus waged a brutal war against the king of the Pontus kingdom, Mithridates. In these circumstances, the Roman authorities didn't perceive this revolt of gladiators and slaves seriously. In their eyes it was an ordinary riot. Riots like this occurred in the Roman Republic from time to time and were not unusual. The authorities viewed the rebels as a gang of robbers and looters and didn't consider them a threat. To suppress the revolt, they sent a small army led by a praetor Gaius Claudius Glaber. It was not a legion, but a militia gathered from poorly trained recruits. Glaber laid siege to the slaves' camp on Vesuvius and blocked the only known passage along which it was still possible to descend from the top of the volcano. His plan was simple – wait for hunger to have its say. However, the runaway slaves managed to weave ropes from the vines that grew all over Vesuvius. Some rebels used the ropes to go down the cliff and attack the Romans from the rear. The Glaber's army was encircled. His inexperienced soldiers panicked. They put down their weapons and tried to flee, but had little luck. Almost all of them were killed, and Glaber himself fell in the battle. But there were losses among the rebels as well. For example, one of the ringleaders of the uprising, Enomaus, fell in this battle. The news of Spartacus' victory spread throughout the area. His army began to multiply. From cities, villas and nearby villages, Slaves started to flee en masse and join the Spartacus army. Meanwhile, the Romans recruited a new army under the command of the praetor Publius Varinius. He decided to split his army, and Spartacus immediately took advantage of this. He attacked the Roman troops commanded by Furius and Cassinius and defeated them. But even after this loss, Varinius still had enough troops 
to stand against Spartacus. Varinius besieged the rebels' camp. The situation was dire, but the rebels managed to trick the Romans and escape. At night they set the corpses of the fallen comrades at the gates and on the walls so that they resembled sentries. They also left a bugler in the camp to blow a horn at night, making Romans believe that the rebels were still there. And under darkness they left the camp and slipped past the Roman patrols. Realizing that Spartacus outwitted him, Varinius moved to the city of Cumae, hoping to replenish his army there. He again tried to attack Spartacus' camp, but suffered a severe defeat and barely escaped captivity himself. After this victory, no forces in southern Italy could stop the rebels. Thanks to his service in Roman auxiliary troops, Spartacus knew the organization and methods of training of the Roman army. He organized the rebel army in the Roman fashion. He split his army into large detachments of several thousand people each, a kind of legion. These units were composed based on ethnicity, so for the soldiers it was easier to communicate with each other. There were detachments made up of Gauls, Germans, Thracians, Greeks, Syrians, etc. The rebels spent most of their free time training and working out. Very quickly, Spartacus turned heterogeneous groups of slaves and gladiators into a well-trained combat-ready army, capable of standing against the Roman legions. And very soon, the rebels had to face not the militia or city guards, but real Roman legions. Starting to understand the seriousness of the threat, the Senate sent two consular armies to suppress the rebellion. They were led by consuls Nius Lentulus Claudianus and Lucius Gellius Poplicola. Every consul led two legions, and together with auxiliary forces and cavalry, the whole size of Roman troops amounted to around 30,000 men. By this time Spartacus had established a foothold in southern Italy and captured several cities. His army was constantly growing. Not only runaway slaves joined him, more and more free people were gathering under his banners, impoverished farmers, shepherds, and people from Italic tribes, especially the Samnites, who were disenfranchised after the social and civil wars. For some reason, the consuls decided to split their forces, apparently hoping to surround Spartacus' army. Lentulus planned to cross the Apennines and move along the Adriatic coast. Gellius, on the other hand, wanted to move along the Appian road to Spartacus' rear. However, thanks to good intelligence, Spartacus learned about these plans and also divided his army. Crixus led 10,000 Gauls and Germans to meet Gellius near Mount Gargano, and Spartacus, with 30,000 soldiers, headed to intercept the army of Lentulus. Spartacus planned to quickly defeat Lentulus and come to the aid of Crixus and thus surround the army of Gellius. The first part of Spartacus' plan worked out perfectly. He managed to intercept the army of Lentulus before he could cross the Apennines. Squads of Spartacus' light infantry constantly attacked the forces of Lentulus, which stretched for almost 10 miles. Eventually, the Romans lost the ability to resist and retreated, suffering significant losses. Although they avoided a complete defeat. Spartacus did not try to chase them. Instead, he immediately marched to Mount Gargano to Crixus' aid. Unfortunately, he was only a day or even a few hours late. Crixus' army was outnumbered and ultimately defeated by the Gellius legions, and Crixus himself fell in battle. Spartacus immediately attacked the Romans who were celebrating their victory and decisively defeated them. Moaning the deceased friend, Spartacus organized unbelievable gladiatorial games at Crixus' funeral. Captive Romans had to become gladiators and fight each other. 150 pairs of captive Romans fought that day, and it was one of the greatest gladiatorial games at that time. After that, the rebels decided to move north towards the Alps, so that everyone could return to their homelands. As Spartacus' army advanced, the uprising spread to new lands. When the news of his approach reached some area, violent riots broke out, slaves broke their chains, attacked the masters, and fled to Spartacus. Several times the Romans tried to block the advance of Spartacus' forces. Still, every time, the victory was on the side of the rebels. One notable battle was at Mutina. In that battle, Spartacus defeated an army of 10,000, led by Gaius Cassius Longinus, father of one of the future assassins of Caesar. Finally, the rebels arrived to the Alps. The road to freedom was open. But at the last moment, Spartacus turned around 
and led the rebels back to the south. It is still unknown why this happened. Some ancient authors say that the warriors inspired by victories demanded Spartacus to lead them to Rome. Still most likely, this is just a reflection of the fears of the Romans themselves. According to another opinion, the rebels simply did not want to leave Italy. They wanted to continue plundering its rich lands or try to establish their own state in Sicily, where there were many enslaved people. Some scholars speculate that Spartacus wanted to join Quintus Sertorius, the rebellious Roman general in Spain. The news of Sertorius' death caused the turnaround. But regardless of the cause, Spartacus' army marched back to the south of Italy. They moved fast, and Spartacus ordered to kill all prisoners and livestock. Also during the march, he stopped accepting new fugitives into his army, so that his soldiers could go as fast as possible. He wanted to get to southern Italy's rich and fertile lands, where it was much easier to provide the army with food. In Rome, panic started to spread, comparable to the terror after the defeat at Cannae, when Hannibal was in the vicinity of Rome. The Romans united two consular armies into one and again tried to intercept Spartacus, and once again they suffered a severe defeat. Battle-hardened squads of former slaves made their way through Roman ranks like a hot knife through butter. The position of Rome was complicated because its best troops and the most experienced generals were outside of Italy. They were waging wars against supporters of Sertorius in the west and Mithridates in the east. Rome needed a skilled general who could lead the army, restore discipline and defeat Spartacus. However, nobody was willing to take on such responsibility until finally the wealthiest man of Rome at that time volunteered for the role, Marcus Licinius Crassus. He had unheard wealth and political influence, but he dreamed of military glory without which, as it seemed to him, he was not respected enough in Rome. Crassus received six legions under his command and two consular legions formed from the remnants of four legions defeated by Spartacus earlier. The very first skirmish of Crassus' troops with Spartacus was unsuccessful. Crassus sent two legions under the command of Marcus Mummius for a roundabout maneuver to flank the Spartacus' army and keep him in suspense, but avoid direct engagement. Mummius ignored the order and attacked Spartacus, wanting to get all the military glory for himself. The result was the brutal defeat of both legions and the loss of both legion eagles, which was an enormous disgrace. Seeing the failure of the flanking maneuver, Crassus retreated. It became clear that the morale of the Roman army was weak. First, it was shattered by a series of defeats from fugitive slaves, whom the Romans did not consider a worthy enemy. Secondly, a war against slaves promised neither rich trophies nor loot, and there were few volunteers to join the army. To restore discipline, Crassus had to take unprecedented measures. He ordered the decimation of Mumius' soldiers, who fled from the battlefield. Each tenth deserter was executed. Two consular legions were also decimated because they repeatedly suffered defeats from the rebels and their morale was low. Such measures made Roman soldiers fear their general more than Spartacus, which helped to restore discipline. Having restored order in the army, Crassus resumed hostilities, but for some time he avoided open confrontation. Spartacus at this time settled in the south of Italy and was actively training fresh recruits and manufacturing weapons and armor. The problem of supplying the army with weapons was so crucial that Spartacus had to ban the use of any gold and silver in his camp. Every available coin was to be spent purchasing iron and copper for the blacksmiths working day and night. Gradually, the rebels started to lose initiative. The Roman and the rebel armies met on the battlefield two times. Spartacus managed to avoid decisive defeat in both battles, and his troops retreated in order, but each time the battleground remained under Crassus' control. Under such circumstances, Spartacus decided to try to break through to Sicily. More than half the population of the island were slaves, and each one of them was a potential soldier for his army. Most recently, the island was torn apart by bloody uprisings, which Romans managed to suppress only at the cost of great efforts and losses. Besides that, even the free Sicilians were not happy under Roman rule and still remembered the times of independence. Spartacus made a deal with the Kilikian pirates to help him cross the Messina Strait. Still, when his forces arrived at the coast, the pirate ships did not come. We don't know why. According to one account, 
Crassus was bribed the pirates. Some scholars speculate that the pirates did not have ships capable of transporting masses of people. They dealt with Spartacus knowing they would not fulfill the deal. In addition, the weather could have been a cause. It was late October and navigation in these waters was perilous. The effect was that the Spartacus army found itself locked on the shores of the Messina Strait. While Spartacus was waiting for the pirates, Crassus soldiers dug a ditch across the entire Aegean Peninsula, poured a rampart behind it, and erected a palisade on top of the ramparts. Spartacus' army got trapped. Food supplies started to run out. The first breakout attempt was unsuccessful. The rebels suffered heavy losses and retreated. Spartacus made another attempt to break out of the encirclement after a while. The main forces of the rebels attacked the fortifications to divert the attention of the Romans. At the same time, a detachment under Spartacus' own lead attacked another part of the fortifications. They managed to fill up the ditch, break through the palisade and fight their way out of the encirclement. About a third of Spartacus' troops made it behind the Roman line. Now, Crassus himself was under threat of being surrounded and started to retreat. But Spartacus did not try to engage the main forces of Crassus and headed straight to the town of Brundisium, hoping to capture ships there. However, taking Brundisium turned out to be impossible for Spartacus. The town was well fortified, and in addition, at the walls of the city, Spartacus was met by the troops of the proconsul Marcus Terentius Lucullus. At the same time, Pompey's legions were approaching from the north to the aid of Crassus. The Roman forces surrounded the rebels from all sides. First, Crassus defeated a small detachment under the command of Gannicus, and then the time came for the final stand. The troops of Spartacus and Crassus met at the Silarius River. According to Plutarch, before the battle Spartacus killed his horse, saying he would not need one in case of defeat. In case of victory, there would be plenty of good horses. Spartacus, accompanied by his best soldiers, rushed forward, trying to get to Crassus. He almost succeeded. He got very close to him and killed two centurions who served as Crassus' bodyguards, but still Spartacus fell, slain by Roman swords. After their general fell, the rebel army could not resist the Romans and was slaughtered. However, victory was not easy for the Romans. Almost half of the Roman army remained dead on the fields by the Celarius river. A small detachment of rebels fled north, where they were met and crushed by Pompey. About 6,000 slaves and gladiators surrendered. Crassus ordered to crucify them along the Appian Road between Capua and Rome. For many years after Spartacus' death, southern Italy still had unrest. Hills, forests and mountains gave refuge to many groups of fugitive slaves. They engaged in robbery and fighting against Romans. The memory of the Spartacus victories on and on inspired slaves to take up arms and turn them against their masters. Crassus craved military glory. For suppressing the Spartacus revolt, he expected no less than a triumph and a laurel wreath, the highest military honors of ancient Rome. But the Senate decided that the enemy in this war was unworthy. To his utter dissatisfaction, Crassus was awarded only with a lesser triumph called Ovatio and a myrtle wreath. Eighteen years later, the lust for fame and military glory would lead Crassus to Parthia, to catastrophe at Carchai and his demise.